Hey folks, the Nexus is one of the first dungeons you'll encounter in Wrath of the Lich King Classic. Even though the trash and boss encounters in this dungeon are relatively simple by modern standards, there are still many important mechanics that you need to know about. Since this guide covers both difficulties, I'll be sure to mention whenever an ability is unique to the heroic version of the dungeon. Finally, while the footage shown here is from Retail World of Warcraft, all of the strategies in this guide are written with Wrath Classic in mind. With all of that being said, let's get into the Nexus. At the start of the dungeon, you'll be faced with multiple branching paths, meaning you can technically tackle the bosses in any order that you want. For the purposes of this guide, I'd recommend taking the left path, as I believe it's the easiest and most efficient. Within the first few hallways, you'll encounter two types of Azur Dragon Spawn, and both of them are extremely easy to deal with. The Azur Magi will simply cast Frostbolt on the tank, and the Warders will periodically cast Silence. After killing one of these mobs and taking another left turn, you will come across a patrol of two Mage Slayers and a Mage Hunter Ascendant. The dogs will silence random targets, which is pretty annoying, but the Mage Hunter here is the real threat. You're going to fight many different copies of this mob throughout the dungeon, and they have access to a whopping 11 different abilities. However, the only spell that all Mage Hunters are guaranteed to use is Aura of Arcane Haste, which grants increased cast speed and spell damage to nearby mobs. If you have a mage in your group, they should definitely make sure to spell steal this buff. For their remaining abilities, the mage hunters come with a set of fire, ice, or arcane spells, but until you get into combat with them, it's impossible to tell which abilities they have. If I explained every one of these 11 spells, we would be here all day, so I'm only going to cover the highlights. Frost hunters can cast Cone of Cold, so tanks should always face these mobs away from the group. Fire hunters will cast Rain of Fire, which is a channeled AoE that should be interrupted. Finally, each hunter will drop a trap on the ground with a different effect depending on their school of magic. All of these trap effects are really bad, so just know that if you see a trap go down, you should move away from it as soon as possible. Now we've reached the Hall of Stasis, and this room is a bit interesting. The mobs within this area are all soldiers of the opposing faction, so horde players will fight alliance mobs and vice versa. Thankfully, the health, damage, and abilities for both versions of these mobs are identical. Within the Hall of Stasis, you'll encounter three types of mobs a Berserker, a Ranger, and a Cleric. Most of their abilities aren't super impactful, but since the Cleric has a heal and a shield, it should probably be your top kill priority. Also, I generally recommend pulling only three mobs at a time, as the Berserkers can overwhelm your tank if you pull too many. After killing the first two packs, you'll come across a faction commander in the middle of the room, and this is where we reach our first major change for Heroic Mode. On normal difficulty, this commander is just a generic trash mob, but on heroic, he serves as a bonus boss with increased health and an additional mechanic. On both difficulties, the commander will cleave targets near the tank and cast Whirlwind, which you should move out of in order to avoid taking damage. He'll also come paired with two clerics, so I would recommend CCing one of them and focusing down the other. On heroic, his new ability is Frightening Shout, which causes all players to run away in fear. Because of this ability, I would highly recommend pulling the commander back to the entrance of the room, as you might otherwise get feared into additional trash. As long as you pull him correctly, kill the cleric, and avoid the whirlwinds, the commander is a really easy boss. Before you reach the next section of the dungeon, you'll still need to finish off two packs of frozen mobs, as well as a mage hunter ascendant patrol. From here, you'll enter the librarian, which contains multiple packs of four mobs. Each pack will come with one Mage Hunter Ascendant, and the three remaining mobs will be a mix of Stewards and Mage Hunter Initiates. The Initiates will cast Drain Mana on nearby targets, apply a Nasty Fire Dot to the tank, and cast Renew on other mobs. Although these abilities are annoying, the Mana Drain can be interrupted, the Dot can be removed with the spells, and the Renew can be purged, making this mob fairly easy to deal with. On the other hand, the Stewards will cast Arcane Torrent, silencing all nearby targets for 4 seconds, and Spellbreaker, which is a ranged attack that reduces a player's spell damage by 75% for 6 seconds. Generally speaking, I would recommend using CC on the Mage Hunter Ascendant, and then focusing down the Stewards over the Initiates. After clearing out the first two packs, you'll come face to face with Grand Magus Telestra, who, for simplicity's sake, I'll refer to as the first real boss of the dungeon. For most of the fight, Telestra will have three different abilities. Instead of auto-attacking, she'll spam cast Firebomb at the tank, which deals fire damage to them and anyone standing within 5 yards. Telestra will also cast Ice Nova, which deals frost damage to all players and stuns them for 3 seconds. Finally, she'll cast Gravity Well, which tosses everyone in the group around for 6 seconds, dealing light shadow damage to them with every bounce. Since you won't be able to cast most healing spells while you're being bounced around, healers should make sure that the group is topped up before Gravity Well is cast. 
once she reaches roughly 60% and 30% health, she'll turn herself into three mirror images. Each mirror image corresponds with a school of magic, so there's one for arcane, fire, and frost. You'll always want to kill off the frost image first, as it deals fairly heavy damage to the group and casts a room-wide blizzard, which should be interrupted immediately. Afterwards, I'd recommend either crowd controlling the arcane ad and killing the fire one, or just killing the arcane ad first and leaving fire for last. The arcane ad will cast a two second group wide stun and polymorph random players, so it's more annoying than it is dangerous. The fire image just deals moderate damage to random players, but overall it's less dangerous than the frost one. After all three images have been defeated, Telestra will reactivate and the fight will continue. As previously mentioned, this intermission happens at 60% and 30% health, so once you've cleared out the images twice and finished off the rest of her health, you can collect your loot. In order to exit the Librarium, you'll want to hug the left wall and clear out one last pack of Mage Hunters, as well as a Mage Hunter Ascendant Patrol. This path will lead to the Rift, and on the first floating platform, you'll encounter two Azure Scalebinders and two Azure Enforcers. The Enforcers will cleave anyone near the tank, and they'll also cast Mortal Strike, which reduces the tank's incoming healing, so healers should be mindful of that. The Scalebinders will mostly just spam cast Arcane Blast, but they'll also cast heal undamaged mobs, so this should be interrupted whenever possible. From here, there are two different bridges you can follow, and you'll want to take the one that leads straight forward. This brings you to a second platform with one Scalebinder, two Enforcers, and a Chaotic Rift. These Rifts don't have a ton of health, and they should be the kill priority whenever they're present in a pack. The primary reason for this is because they'll continually summon extra adds until they're killed, but they'll also constantly pulse a chain lightning effect onto the nearest target. If possible, the best way to kill this rift is to have your ranged DPS kill it from afar so that nobody takes damage from the chain lightning. This won't always be possible though, so if you do need to kill it in melee, your healer should just be prepared to heal through the incoming damage. After killing this pack, you'll want to continue forward and hop off the ledge. It's technically possible to thread the needle here and avoid pulling either of the elemental packs, but in my experience, someone will usually fuck up and aggro both of them, meaning this strategy is highly likely to wipe your group. A more reliable strategy is to just jump into the pack on the right, which contains a mana surge and multiple crazed mana rates. The mana rates are non-elite mobs, and they're identical to the ones spawned by the Chaotic Rift. All they really do is cast arcane missiles in the tank, so they're not too difficult to handle. The crazed mana surge, on the other hand, is fairly annoying, as it'll cast mana burn on random targets and has another spell called Arcane Nova, which deals damage to all players and heals all nearby trash mobs. Once you've cleared out this pack, you'll want to head up the ramp to your left, at which point you'll have to fight one more pack with two mana surges and a chaotic rift. As always, the chaotic rift is the kill priority. This brings us to Anomalous, the second and arguably hardest boss encounter of the dungeon. Anomalous himself doesn't really do a whole lot. He'll mostly just auto-attack the tank and shoot arcane bolts at random players. What makes this fight difficult is the chaotic rifts which he spawns periodically. They function exactly the same as the ones found in trash packs, and if you get two of them active at the same time, the damage can get pretty insane. If a rift stays alive for too long, Anomalous will also buff it, increasing the range of the chain lightning effect and speeding up the spawn time of crazed mana wraiths. During the first 50% of the fight, you'll want to make sure to always kill off any chaotic rift that spawns. This is because Anomalous will become immune to all damage at 50% health until you kill off every Chaotic Rift. Once the Rifts are finished and Anomalous is once again attackable, you have two options. If you're really confident in your group's damage, you can just kill off Anomalous and ignore any new Rifts that spawn. Personally though, I'd recommend playing it safe and continuing to kill off all the Rifts that spawn until Anomalous is actually dead. While moving on to the next pack of trash, you could take the long way and go all the way back down the ramp, but if you like to live on the edge, I'd recommend jumping off this platform in order to immediately reach the next pack. It's possible to just barely make this jump without any movement speed increases, but admittedly, it is fairly tight. And just to be clear, you do need to jump, simply walking off the edge will not suffice. Now you could just walk off the side slightly to the right, but let's be real, that's way less cool. Regardless of how cool your method of travel was though, you'll have to fight one more pack of mana elementals and then some dragon spawn and a chaotic rift. Clearing these out will bring you to the last section of the dungeon, the Singing Grove. Within this area, you'll encounter a ton of little crystalline flare ads. At first glance, these guys may seem insignificant, but after they die, they turn into a seed pod which grants nearby players a really powerful buff. While this is active, all players will take 25% less damage and restore health and mana every two seconds. Because of how easy it is to kill these mobs, you should pretty much always have this buff active as you clear out the rest of this trash. Throughout the Singing Grove, you'll encounter packs of Crystalline Keepers and Crystalline Tenders. 
The Keepers have a buff on them called Crystal Bark, which deals damage to attackers and has a chance to stun them. It counts as a magic effect, so you'll want to purge this off if possible. The Tenders will cast Tough and Hide on themselves, which grants them increased armor and magic resistance. They'll also cast Tranquility whenever nearby mobs are low in health, so this should be interrupted whenever it goes out. The final mobs in this area are the large treants called Crystalline Protectors, and their only truly notable ability is a frontal cone that they'll cast at the tank. They'll also cast Thunderclap, which deals damage to nearby targets, but as long as ranged DPS or healers aren't standing near the Protector, it shouldn't be an issue. While moving through this area, you'll generally want to be heading to the left, as that's where the next boss is located. However, if you position yourself carefully, you can also avoid pulling most of the Crystalline Protectors. There are five of them in total, but provided you hug the wall as shown, you only need to pull one of them before starting the next boss. Speaking of which, the third boss of the dungeon is Ormorok the Tree Shaper. Before pulling him, you should drag one of the Crystalline players into the boss arena and kill it to gain the 25% damage reduction buff. Throughout the fight, Ormorok will cast three different abilities. Trample is an instant cast AoE around the boss, so ranged players should make sure that they're stood away from it. Spell Reflection does exactly what it sounds like, and it can reflect up to 4 spells until it expires. The best way to handle this is to cast a bunch of low rank spells to consume the charges, and then continue your damage rotation. Ormorok's main ability is Crystal Spikes, which causes 4 lines to appear throughout the room. After a few seconds, these lines will erupt with large spikes, causing anyone standing nearby to take damage and be launched into the air. Getting hit by this ability can be incredibly deadly, as it deals a heavy chunk of damage and causes you to take additional damage from falling. Ideally, everyone in your group should just avoid getting hit by the spikes, but if someone does get hit, your healer should be ready to save them. Finally, on Heroic Mode, Ormorok will also periodically summon Crystalline Tanglers, which are small adds that root players upon landing a melee attack. When they spawn, everyone in your group should immediately swap to them, as getting rooted can lead to a player being comboed by the Crystal Spikes. After Ormorok has fallen, you'll want to head up the tunnel to the left and drop down towards the exit of the Singing Grove. Before reaching the final boss room, you'll have to dispatch one final pack of Crystalline Keepers and Tenders, as well as a Crystalline Protector which blocks the exit. Just across the hallway, you'll be able to see Karastraza, who is the final boss of the Nexus. Before the fight begins, Karastraza will be stuck in a frozen prison, and the room is guarded by one Azur Magus Ad. You'll want to kill off this Ad first, and then activate the nearby spears to disable Karastraza's prison. Karastraza herself has only four abilities, and they're all fairly easy to deal with, provided you understand them. Crystal Fire Breath is a cone directed at the tank which leaves behind a dot, so healers should dispel this if they're able. As with most dragons, Karastraza comes with a tail sweep, so nobody should be standing behind her. The primary mechanic of this fight, however, is Intense Cold, which is a dot that ramps up over time and deals heavy frost damage as well as slowing the player's casting speed. This sounds really bad until you realize that all of your stacks are removed if you jump or move around. Melee DPS should literally spend the entire fight jumping up and down, as it means they'll never gain any stacks of the debuff. While casters could also jump, it's generally better to do short strafes, as this will result in less downtime. Karastraza's final ability on normal difficulty is Crystal Chains, which roots a random player for 10 seconds. This should be dispelled the moment it goes out, as otherwise the rooted player will gain multiple stacks of intense cold. On Heroic, this ability is upgraded to Crystallize, causing it to root every single player. If you have a priest in your group, you should remain somewhat close together, as Mass Dispel will completely trivialize this mechanic. If you don't have a priest, you simply have to rely on individual dispels or abilities like Hand of Freedom. It's also worth noting that at 25% health, Karastraza will gain a fairly powerful Enrage effect, so you should remove this with Trank Shot or similar effects if possible. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know in order to clear normal or heroic Nexus in Wrath of the Lich King Classic. If you want to learn more about the other dungeons present in Wrath Classic, I'd recommend checking out my Dungeon Guide playlist, which you can find linked in the description below.